Patty, welcome back. Good to see you. It is so excellent to be here. Thank you. Congratulations on all of your continued and well-deserved recognition. You keep showing up for work. I have the best job on the planet. <laughs> and it's not fair or right that I should have that. But good heavens, I guess I am a workaholic, except that so much of what I do is so extremely satisfying and fun that yeah. I should be. Well, you were talking about fun earlier. I'm a funaholic. There yes. you are. So. Well, when you show up to work, th things happen. Good things happen. So we're glad that's continuing. Um, you're here, I think, because it, it feels like a good time to sort of step back and think about history. There are some wacky things going on, unprecedented things in some ways. But as an historian, I suspect um, there are really not that many things that are totally unprecedented. Uh, for example, we seem to be in a, in a tizzy about immigration. And uh, certainly in this part of the country, in the western part of the United States, that's, that's nothing new. Um, maybe you could remind our listeners about who the real immigrants are around here. <laughs> That's going to take quite a long time. <laughs> That's really, do we have several days to go through, <laughs> through that? Um, uh, well, obviously, there were some folks who were here for a very long haul, Indian people, and I don't know that I would have them in that category, no. but they were certainly mobile yeah. and dynamic and not frozen in place waiting for white folks to show up. So there's right. a lot of activity going on before our, our people, I might just call them that, came into the picture. Yeah. Uh, goodness gracious, people came from every imaginable starting point on the planet. Yeah. Just name a place. And the California Gold Rush was certainly one of those kinds of occasions where Everybody showed up. But before that, the Spanish Empire, the right. French trappers, the, um, the Russians, the British. I had one terrible episode as a teacher, which I might share with your audience. I had two students who told me that they had a really good idea why they wouldn't have to take the midterm. They would do a game called the Conquest Game. And they would design it as a, a game that we could all play together. And they worked very hard on that. And they had four different empires, the four empires I just mentioned. And the different groups were at different corners of the room. And there were chairs in the middle. And there were native people. In the, they, and then each of the colonial governors was to send people out. And they had a soldier and a missionary. So it was actually pretty realistic. The bad news, and I, I'm not comfortable entirely confessing this. So the students said to me, well, Patty, as we understand it, alcohol was an important trade good. Well, yes, that's historically accurate. And so they said, it seems important for us to include that in our, <laughs> in our in, game. In our, to be realistic, yeah, it's only yes, fair. Seems yes, and, and I can't say, oh, no, that didn't figure in <laughs> uh, the story of Empire. So, so they showed up, and they had a bunch of those little bottles you see on airplanes. And I thought, well, it's a 10 o'clock class, so we'll just, they'll just pass those around and... Uh, See you. <laughs> it's a wonderful school. It is a very serious school, but it wasn't. Oh lordy, it, it didn't. Uh, so when we finished our really not inaccurate historical, re all the col the colonial governors all lost control of their empires. They were shouting orders, at, and that was actually pretty realistic. So, so uh, when we left, the trash cans were well. Filled up, yeah. yeah, and but, I just thought, don't let the Board of Regents be walking through yeah, exactly. the building at this point. <laughs> so that wasn't what you asked. You didn't ask for that. So No, so, I, did, I, I did ask you that. I wanted a realistic picture of what really happened in the settling of the American West, and that was pretty damn good. <laughs> it came out. Yeah. It came out. But really, back to the point, uh, so that people did come from every starting point on the planet. And I don't know that how we would ever verify the statement I'm about to make, but I also don't think we could ever disprove it, that... The people coming into Western North America from every starting point spent a lot more time talking with each other, trading with each other, psyching each other out. Well, I have to say this, sleeping with each other. Well, procreating is what we've had right. from the earlier guests as a, 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 a good <laughs> phrase there. So, so they did all of that a lot more than they spent fighting, injuring, right. killing yeah. each other. In, including... Uh, you know, learning languages and yes. sharing, sharing the ability to communicate, and yes. and um, and so in, can in I that go, sense, can I take a moment on that oh, because yeah. those those people, every significant transaction in Western American history, the key figure in many many of those was the interpreter, the translator. Those are figures that uh, any kind of occasion between mm -hmm. Indian people and, and white people, or sometimes between tribes, they are almost unwritten about and mm -hmm. unnoticed in Western American history. And I am, I, oh, I plead with graduate students, please do that because they are such important figures, mm -hmm. and 
the importance of translators and interpreters has not gone, gone away. There's a woman, I think her name was Marina Groves, who was translating in Helsinki. She became very famous. Right. Because uh, those figures are so crucial. And I don't know that she particularly wanted to be famous, but right. that will well, happen. What a, but it speaks to another kind of translation, which is the, the uh, sort of intransigence and the fear and the disinterest in learning about other cultures and other mm -hmm. countries and other languages and so on. Um, just the, the bridge between these two camps, one that's sort of uh, f fearful, and, uh, I, and I'm not sure what the fear is about. It might be, is there a fear that, that newcomers won't assimilate or won't communicate or won't fit in or that they'll, what, what's the fear all about? In Western history, on some occasions, it's, it might be easier to move our minds in the direction of the fearful. I'm going to go with white workers in California after the gold rush who were in California with such a sense of opportunity that they were going to go to this place and wonderful things would happen. By the time they got there in the 1870s, the opportunities were really very constrained and they found themselves as wage workers for, for railroad companies and, and it was a a terrible twist on high expectations and deep disappointment. So you could... Because, may I interrupt, because those jobs were taken by Chinese immigrants? No, well, or see, because that's the thing, is that uh, they found themselves constrained in their opportunities. They could have directed that rage at the companies, at the employers, or could, they could have found a scapegoat. And indeed, that turned out to be the easier path mm -hmm. of emotion to say, the Chinese must go. Which, because they were disappointed. Because they had, they have understandable, they had understandable sense that they had tried something, they had taken risks. Uh, if they had been there 20 years earlier for the gold rush, they might have had something to come of that. So people experiencing frustration, uh, despair, and not having the moment, the desire, the guidance, the patience, the, the inquiry to say, mm -hmm. what's going on here? What happened to me? It's very uh, tempting to say it's those guys. It's yeah, and that's, and that's kind of what's going on. I think that's right. I yeah. think there's also, oh dear me, I'm uh, such a, I profited so much from coming to know people that I thought I would find repellent. If I could, some of those people might know who they are as I say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, okay. So there have been occasions in life where I thought, oh, that would not be the kind of person I would enjoy, but I was stuck. And I had to spend time with those people, and I, almost without exception, there are a few, but maybe four exceptions where I have... Didn't, get, didn't make a connection of some right. kind. Right, and yeah. so, but I, I, I understand that if we keep our distance from each other, and if we look in dismay and disapproval, and if we are thrown off by surface impressions, and we never yeah. get that, that opportunity. So I know this is, I'm just embarrassing myself here, because it's, it's going to, we're going to join arms and sing, he's got the whole world, because <laughs> I, or I'm singing some kind of National Brotherhood Week thing, but I do think there are wonderful opportunities for introductions, and, and there's also wonderful opportunities for some contemplation of uh, facts, which are not universally embraced uh, right. these days, but for... For decades, English as a second language programs have been oversubscribed, and there have been waiting lists for people to get into those programs. So that's a fact. And at the same time, there are people declaiming that a whole bunch of people don't want to be in America and don't want to be part of America and want to keep their distance and want to be... Uh, not participating in our society. Don't want to learn the language and so on. Right. Yeah. And then we have these, these lines waiting lists, yeah. of waiting lists on that. And yeah. I don't know if there's anything more gratifying. I, I was a volunteer in the adult literacy program years ago. It was an English language speaker who was my person. But if there is anything more enjoyable than engaging in the exploration of language with somebody who's not able to take for granted what you're taking for granted and the hilarity that can happen if there's anything more fun than people thinking that they're communicating but being in a, in a good state where they can say, I thought you meant. That's right. so fun. And yeah. that's why it's so lucky we have so many languages on the planet because our chances of misunderstanding each other festively <laughs> are so <laughs> unlimited. It's just a great... Look, Honor. so you are a funaholic. You're going to look for fun <laughs> everywhere and I even am. in complete misunderstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Hey, in case you just tuned in, you're listening to E-Town. I'm here with Patty Limerick. Um, I want to ask you just, just lastly uh, about this opportunity you have as a professor, because you come in contact with young people all the mm -hmm. time, and yet you've got this long view as an historian. Mm -hmm. So you've got this great sort of uh, perspective where you can see, see these sort of both sides of what's really going on, and many people are in one or the other camp. So... Mm -hmm. Tell me what's on the mind of the minds of your students these days. What are they? What are they concerned well, about? Uh, we begin with a, uh, I don't know what, just a regrettable confession that I was losing them for a while. I think there was a spell where I was doing, I was starting to sound like someone I found repellent. Of, I don't know these young people. I don't know what they're. Oh, good lord! So, uh, so last semester I just, and I wasn't doing much of that, but I was doing some of that, and I just thought that's going to end. You're going to be in contact with them. You're going to make every overture. If, you are, uh, if those overtures are rejected, then you'll make five more. So my team teacher, Alice Baumgartner, and I did that. And we met young people, and we met people in ways that were so disarming and so excellent. And they came on board with us. Uh, our class is really about taking the conflicts of the West and moving our perspectives around so that we can see how a position that at first makes a person think, why would you ever? Well, then we go in there. And so our students were just, I mean, we wept from time to time. It was so, so moving. They, we had, I'm sorry, to, I'm going to use an academic word. I usually don't do that. But uh, we did walk them through four dichotomies that we think entirely jam up thinking in the West, ways either or, immigrant or native born, uh, those kinds of polarities as if we all came labeled with clear categories. And mm -hmm. in fact, we are almost all, well, we're always hybrid and we're always mixed and we're all out. So our students got that concept that if you want to, and it was uh, one young man, Bryce, came into the office one day and he said, I don't think it was his intention, by the way, to really be deeply moved by this class, but, he, but we badgered him until he agreed to be moved. Um, <laughs> and so he came in and he said, I really like this thing that you had us do, where instead of say, saying either or, we just take out the word or and we put an and, and we see what happens when we do that. So myth versus reality, myth or reality. We say myth and reality, because heaven knows that's totally intertwined in human mm -hmm. life. So Bryce wanted to do his final project on that whole exercise of putting the and where the or usually comes. Yeah. And so that's why, I mean, Alice and I are not yeah, easily moved to tears, but there were moments where we just thought, this is, this is great. And I will say that doesn't come out when you think of these uh, young folks who were so willing to take that on, mm -hmm. of we want to do that in life. We want to, to cross over and find out who's there, who was our opposite number. And then you look around at our national political scene, you think, these young people, you think, would you like to go Right. somewhere else for a little while and then <laughs> yeah. come back when we have this in better control? Is there a, a nice island you might right. they say to them? Our cases are very nice <laughs> and you might want to do that and then come back when we've got this pulled back together here because it is yeah. not a, uh, I don't feel. Or do we in fact engage them to the point where we rely on them to, to, to affect the change that they can now, they're not prepared to, to initiate with but, these skills yeah. either and? I, I can see many reasons to get to passing batons on. Yeah. When uh, the baby boomers loosen their grip <laughs> on Over my cold dead various hands. things yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, and become uh, delightful old codgers. I mean, we're really, we have, <laughs> it'll be fine and tell the same old stories. And yeah. I, did, I did meet Jim Morrison on the street when I was at uh, 1967 in, in San Francisco. So I can be sitting in the nursing home telling wow, the story about yeah. meeting Jim Morrison yeah. who <laughs> never got to be in a nursing home. So that would be an interesting angle to take on that. But, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a boomer nursing home story made, <laughs> just made for TV, right? Perfect. Right. Um, but what we would, so, so what you did mention was this, this um, this exercise that helped people see that, that, that the polarization mm -hmm. doesn't lead to either communication or actually solving anything. Right, right. But what you didn't mention is what issues these kids are concerned about. And I just, I ask that because yeah. I suspect as they think about their future and the things that are uh, on their minds, 
I wonder whether immigration is not among the things that are top of mind for them. I mean, for example, yeah. they're probably concerned about environmental issues. They're probably concerned about the health of the planet or the supply mm -hmm. of water or things like that. What, what are they thinking about? They certainly are thinking about environmental issues. They certainly are thinking about uh, climate change and uh, water, water allocation and adjustments to drought and scarcity. Uh, Depending on their circumstances, they may be thinking about wildlands fire. They're thinking about a whole bunch of issues. Energy, good heavens, energy yeah. is a very big, mm -hmm. big thing for them. I'll, and with immigration, I'm not. I, I know that this semester, this last semester, what I just thought is that I am through talking about education just for the soul. Not that I ever did much of that, but we were just flat out and saying we are teaching you skills that will get you the jobs that you want. And that turned out to be really good because teaching them to write better didn't instantly please them. Right. Um, so, so, but we could say, and we had many people to back us up on that, this will make a difference in your getting jobs and retaining jobs yeah. and so on. So I guess I might have been doing that just to say I understand anxiety over careers and jobs. And I want to have my students as equipped as possible so yeah. that they never have to think, who's the scapegoat that kept me from getting getting what I wanted. Yeah. Nice. That's, that's a lovely, um, lovely uh, sort of full circle to our, our little time together, Patty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks once again, <laughs> Professor Patty Limerick, historian. <laughs>